Hey folks, you are in for a treat today. Uh, my conversation partner today is Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, an inspiring Buddhist Zen teacher and one of the deepest thinkers on race and contemplative traditions in the world. She has been called uh, the most vocal and intriguing African-American Buddhist in America, and her bio calls her an author, maverick spiritual teacher, love that, and master trainer, and she's the second black woman to be recognized as a teacher in her lineage of Zen Buddhism. Her life's work is putting into practice her unwavering belief that the key to transforming society is transforming our inner lives. She calls for a deep paradigm shift that, quote, changes the way change is done, envisioning the building of a presence-centered social justice movement as the foundation for personal freedom, a just society, and the healing of divisions of race, class, faith, and politics. As she notes, love and justice are not two. Without interchange, there can be no outer change. Without collective change, no change matters. Reverend Angel is also fast becoming a teacher of mine, and I'm deeply excited for this conversation. Welcome, mm. Reverend Angel, and thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you, thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> well, it, it really is my pleasure. Um, getting to know you over the last couple of weeks has been a real, real, real pleasure of mine. Um, so uh, the first couple of questions I wanted to ask uh, for folks to hear about, uh, hear your answer to is, you know, about your personal upbringing and how, what brought you to this moment in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first question, I'll just jump in. What is your spiritual or religious inheritance? Okay. Uh, so my spiritual inheritance uh, where I began is uh, in a Black Baptist church. My dad was, uh, is Catholic, but not terribly practicing. Um, my mom was somewhat a religious in the sense of, in you know the sense that many many people uh, exist. Um, very spiritual, uh, but not necessarily uh, attending organized religion churches and that kind of thing. Um, but I had a babysitter that was you know part of my life in very early formative years, and she was very much uh, invested in the Black Baptist Church, and so that meant that I was introduced and inducted into the Black Baptist Church. Uh, and so that was really kind of my earliest sense of church and religion and where I formed some early ideas and I want to say also early resistances to uh, some of the religious teachings that I received. And I went on to participate in the Episcopal Church, which was my stepmother's, uh, later stepmother's church as well. Mm. Yeah. So, and I did uh, some dabbling, yeah. You did some dabbling. Yeah. Um, you know, when I did some dabbling in terms of like checking places out, but by the time I was 12, I had I declared myself an agnostic and kind of went on from there until I eventually found my way to the Zen tradition. How, how did you find your way to the Zen tradition? Yeah. Um, so this is very funny for those people that are New Yorkers. There used to be a tower bookstore and I'm sure that there are other traces of things that existed beforehand. And my entryway was really art because I became fascinated by the spareness of art and the spareness of the aesthetic of the Zen tradition. So I just went looking for a book that would have the word Zen in it because I wanted to know like, what is that and why am I you know, so moved by it? I was very moved by Zen art and the presentation. So I found this book that, I'm going to say this little old book and the Zen people will know what I'm saying, called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. It's an utter classic by Shunra Suzuki Roshi, who was the founder of San Francisco Zen Center uh, and is probably the most, one of, out of one or two of the most classic Western Zen books and uh, a way in which people have accessed it. And one of the things that I realized that is really telling of the fact that I'm so aligned with this as a tradition is that, you know, you get excited about something and you say, oh, you should read this book. And to other people, it was like, this is total Greek. I have no idea what this book is <laughs> being or talking oh, about. Wow. And to yeah. me, it was like someone had reached inside my head 
and said like, oh, all of the ways in which you, your thinking is different than much of the Western uh, Judeo-Christian uh, religious sphere is, is right here in this book of, uh, that's talking about this you know, very different way of life. I want to say too that some of the and someone just you know like noted this today that some there's probably some early infiltration from the fact that I went to school uh, junior high school in Chinatown, and so there's sort of Buddhist inf influence there that probably I was not cognizant of, but in in hindsight I'm sure that that had something to do with you know the real foundation of the orientation that I had towards spirituality. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. And so uh, when you were first being exposed to, to Zen Buddhism, did, uh, were you like all in or did you have like dabble and then come back? How did it, how did it work for you? Oh yeah. You know, once I got there, it was like all in, I'm pretty much like that. And so I, I check it out and you know, the, I, I appreciated the Buddha's admonitions that you shouldn't just take this as, and believe it, that you should try it out, you should put it, apply it in your life and experience it, and then if it works for you, like, go for it. And so I was like, okay, go for it. Mm -hmm. I had a great opportunity of actually being able to go to San Francisco uh, with a friend of mine at the time, and I got to visit San Francisco Zen Center. And so it was sort of like going to what had become a new spiritual home, but I had my closet practice, literally closet practice. I had a closet that had my kind of like wow. makeshift meditation set up. Um, but then going to San Francisco, I had a chance to go to San Francisco Zen Center, get my first formal meditation instruction at the center there. And I came back with a, a Zafu, which is the small round cushions that are, Part, very much, you know, um, popularized in terms of Zen meditation and, and meditation, I would say in general, actually. Mm. And so that really cemented something for me. And I have to say that when I found myself on the other side of the country, you know, was, I, I now live in the Bay Area, but as a New Yorker, found myself on the other side of the country, waking up so that I could go to participate in meditation I was waking up at 5 a.m. so I could get there. I was like, okay, something has happened. How old were you? How old were you then? That's what I knew. Uh, I was 22. Mm. Mm. 22. So I've got, I've got a few years. So I had been dabbling myself, but at, at, it was at 22 that I had my formal instruction. So it was about, I would say about, you know, from about 20 that I started uh, dabbled by myself for two years and then went and had that formal instruction it's you know been love ever since mm -hmm. and you i mean obviously you've been writing a lot about and your book that we'll get into a little later about how race shows up in buddhist communities and as a black woman entering buddhist communities for the first time as a young person was that showing up for you then how oh, yeah. uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> yes uh-huh um, yeah, of course you get there, you know, you can't be a person of color that doesn't recognize uh, that you're the only person there and that that's a repeated experience wherever you went. Now, what happened is I left San Francisco Zen Center, I went back to New York, and then I did, you know, the kind of like hunt and shopping around and trying to figure out where it was going to be my home. I was also very, very strongly influenced, I should say, by the Shambhala Buddhist tradition that was founded by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. So that was always fed into my understanding and the way that I approached and related to Buddhist practice and Buddhist thinking at all. And, I, and that's significant and meaningful for me to say because it was very much rooted in and continues to be rooted in this notion of warriorship, which I think for as a person of color, sort of really coming to terms with oppression in society and the way in which people of color were being treated. And I could see that and I was uh, being politicized at the same time. Mm. Uh, that warriorship was a very important access point for me because it felt empowering. And so it wasn't 
something that was just about like believe something that someone says and just sort of go with that mm. um, and no disrespect to people that have a real f- deep faith orientation but it just wasn't the way that I was wired and then simultaneously the sort of active role of warriorship being the way in which one approached one's spiritual life where the enemy was the the ego construct that inhibited us from being able to access our full lives that really worked for me. And it became something that I very much felt would work for people that were often victimized, experienced themselves as victims, Mm -hmm. could take on victimhood as a form of internalized oppression. And so it was working just working for me just on multiple levels. And I think it was the confluence of both the Zen tradition as well as the Shambhala tradition. Mm -hmm. And in that early time, are there specific teachers or thought partners that stand out for you that really influenced how you were thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I would say definitely Trungpa Rinpoche. That was um, formidable in terms of an orientation that I had. And by, he was, uh, he had passed away by that time. And so I did a lot of deep digging into the Shambhala tradition. Uh, And I went to Shambhala, New York, and I just could not bear it. It was, uh, you know, there's, there's whiteness as a construct, there's as a racial construct, there's whiteness in a sort of like loose way in which we talk about white folks. And I came from New York where like whiteness showed up in such different ways that it wasn't this sort of like massive, like, thing that felt like it was overwhelming because I had friends that were Jewish and Italian and Irish. And my dad is a uh, fireman and his dad was a fireman. So lots of contact with Irish and Italian, uh, uh, you know, folks that were, you know, fellows that were in the, in the uh, fire department. And so my range and Polish people. And so my range of like white skinned people was quite vast. And, and Shambhala was a kind of like, uh, New York, the New York uh, Center at the time was just a sort of f- form, I want to say, like a, a, a particular strain of um, upper middle class whiteness that f- had a, a, f- a feeling of being um, oppressive, uh, where people turned around and looked at you and the, the a feeling, you, you know, I just had a very strong feeling of I was not welcome. Whether that was true or not is, you know, not something that I could possibly know, but I didn't feel welcome there and uh, ended up going with the Zen tradition, even though I was so strongly influenced by Shambhala because I felt more comfortable there. The, the home that I landed at was in, in Greenwich Village and that just made a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. My root teacher was a, a, a lesbian and you know, it was like, it just like, oh, oh. To me in that way. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm also thinking about my own uh, attempts to maintain a contemplative practice, and mm-hmm. also the way in which uh, when I'm angry about something or I'm feeling like a thing that's on my mind, how how much harder it is. Um, was that uh, something like as you were developing your your practice? Was it like how did that show up for you? Um, you know, around and and finding a home. I mean, clearly was very important. Yeah. Uh, So I want to just say, you know, that like, I think that I, a a few things really quickly is that I'm I'm kind of like the anti-Buddhist. And so I I really didn't relate to it as Buddhism. I should just say that, right? It was like Zen. I was doing Zen. I wasn't doing Buddhism. I was doing Zen. Can you talk about the distinction? Yeah. Help help me. Yeah. You know, um, there are people that have an orientation towards Buddhism as a religion. And there are people that have an orientation toward towards it much more as a way of life and a philosophy. And I kind of hung out on the edge of philosophy and way of life as a path. This was my path. So I almost never talked about being Buddhist. Um, I mean, it it showed up and there were some very formal things and and Zen's got a a fair amount of, you know, I like to say high drama to it at, at particular moments. And so it's definitely there, but it isn't what I embraced in terms of an orientation, which just makes sense that I didn't embrace the religiosity of Christianity mm. either. Mm. And so uh, I was a very much a mm. philosophical Buddhist, um, I think, until 
uh, you know, time and, and developed. And I think that also has something to do with maturity and what we need and what we perceive and becoming less rigid about the def definitions and other people's definitions versus, versus my definition. Mm -hmm. And so Zen re was really like, you know, it had all of these connotations of being cool, of being even minded, of being, you know, you just be Zen about something. Uh -huh. so that, that sense of like a philosophical approach and a, and, a, and a how you showed up is really the way that I related to it. And so that's, I think, what saved me, if you will, if you will, the, the sense of like this practice being about how you showed up and so, and, and much less attention on what other people were doing. And that really reoriented me away from anger about situations and much more towards observation. Mm, mm, great, thank you. Yeah. So uh, speaking more, a little more about your uh, spiritual life and practice, what is the question that you struggle with the most today in your practice? What is the question I struggle with the most? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> First of all, I, I have like issued the word struggle. I just don't use it. And I, I kind of, I, ref, I sort of rather strongly refuse it. Um, it's, it, yeah, I have this thing about, you know. I love so it. I love what, it. Is the, yeah. what, what is the opposite, right? What do you say? Do you unstruggle? Do you de-struggle, right? And, and so, I'm very much about words and the way in which words impact us internally as a vibration and as a, as a way in which we orient. And so the fact that there's no readily available linguistic way to put an end to struggle doesn't really work for me. So I get rid of struggle. I, I think that the question that I revisit most often and I try to wrap myself around is, Really, how do I create more access to people to have the opportunity for a liberated life? And what does that look like for me, right? Like, so what, what are the edges that I'm working with in any given moment that lead towards liberated life? And, and of course, the main question that is at the seed of that is what is a liberated life for me, not someone else's idea of liberated life, not, not someone else's idea of being enlightened or um, what it means to be a Zen priest or a teacher or anything like that. But what it, what is it? And to really dig down into like, what is it that I experience and recognize uh, what's the hum? What's the vibration that as I move through my life, I recognize, Oh yes, I am feeling more of a liberated life than yesterday. And for you, uh, what is it that makes a liberated life? Uh, not being bound to deadlines. <laughs> uh, so I really, or I, you know, in all, in all areas, uh, the sense of being unhindered in terms of how I express myself to do that with truth and honesty and also from a place of love to be undefended about the way in which I show up in my life. And so that I'm not guarding a, the territory of angel in any given moment. And when I find a territory that I want to guard to check what, check out what that's about, um, to have appropriate rest and self care to, to really regard myself with a great deal of love and honoring that my life force is, is valuable inherently and so that I should regard it in that way as, as precious as anything divine, anything that we look towards to uh, feed our spiritual lives, that, that I am that and, and in that to, to really care for myself in that way. Um, and to live, to be able to, for me to, to live a liberated life is to share that with other people as much as I can. And to do that in a way that meets them exactly where they are, as opposed to assuming that they should be in a place that I am or would like them to be. But I love to tease that out and, and help people come to a recognition that they are not only as a liberated life possible, but they're entitled to it. And that they're, accessing their choice choice to access a liberated life for themselves is in fact an offering to the entire society. 
Mm. Mm. Great, thank you. So uh, this might seem like a funny question in some ways because we've talked so much about this, but um, for people encountering you for the first time who really don't think that inner transformation matters all that much to social justice, what would you say? <laughs> um, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing I'd say. <laughs> Listen, you know, we do, I have this, um, maybe we'll do, we'll do something with this together in the future, Isaac, but I have a, a video I actually, a, a small, the beginnings of a small video that I produced that, that it, it gets to exactly this question, particularly with activists, because, you know, they're, they, they have a very clear sense of like, you know, moving policy and you know we all are signing online petitions and that kind of thing and really looking at where the action is at so to speak voting right and getting out the vote and that kind of thing and where the action is at in terms of shifting society um and so this but i i started to share uh contemplative practices and meditation and embodiment practices with activists and of course the main question is like why why would I want to do that? And I realized very quickly that I had to answer that question and have a ready answer for that question before I try to induct someone into like meditation. Cause otherwise I'm just like selling them my wares, right? It's like, mm -hmm. here's my wares. Mm -hmm. I've got this meditation thing and it's awesome. And why right. you should just do it? Right. Well, right. Tell people what's the benefit if you know marketing at all, right? Like what is the benefit for them? And so this little video is basically, uh, pointing to it goes through a series of things and it points to the the awareness that we all have this experience that we all have that despite our best efforts we turn around we, you know, we kind of get in the, the the drivers you know we get in the on the road to life and we turn around and we look back and and despite our best effort we leave roadkill behind of unwanted behaviors and outcomes and we look behind us and, and we're like, wow. And sometimes it's small and sometimes it's huge. And the question is, how does that happen? How is it that with all of our knowledge, we have access to the world's knowledge, whether that's in spiritual traditions or religious traditions or just, you know, um, uh, uh, what do, you, what, do, what do we call it? Self-help book, right? It's like all that self-help stuff becomes as Wendy Palmer would say, shelf help, right? And so what is that about? We're not lacking access to information. We're not at lacking, you know, tips. Every day something comes out, the five rules to this, the seven tips to that, the 10 best ways to this. So we're not lacking access. And yet still, best intentions, wanting to have a better society, wanting to live our lives in a better way, wanting to be fair, just, compassionate. We look back and there is a mess of things that we have left behind that is evidence that we're not fully in control. So who might actually be in control? And, and what I would say is it's our inner life, that we have that an aspect of ourselves that's really at the driver's seat of our lives. And when we think we're holding on to the steering wheel there, we turn around and we realize, whoa, it's actually our inner selves that have been shaped by a variety of experiences, including our upbringing, the traumas that we have experienced, the love that we have perceived to have felt or not felt, the wounds that we have experienced, the communities that we've been brought up, shame, guilt, blame, uh, uh, forms of oppression that are about race and class and gender, sexual orientation, the way in which we are perceived, the way in which we are taught to perceive ourselves. All of this has shaped our inner lives. And on the outside, we're walking around trying to look like moderately functional human beings. And it turns out that all of that stuff going on the inside is actually driving us. And it is very much a part of the motivation, which is the reason that we can turn around despite our best mental efforts and look and say, wow, my life is not turning out the way that I would choose for it, that I believe I'm practicing for it. And so we've got to work with that inner life. We've got to work with that inner you, if, that I, I would say, to really come to terms with a kind of alignment between the inner life that is actually driving us and the outer you that actually functions in the world and, and actually um, 
does the particular behavior. So the inner life is kind of like, you know, it's like good devil, bad devil, right? The, 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 the good angel and the bad devil sitting on each side of your shoulders. And the good angel is saying, you know, yeah, you know, you're going to come across your, your partner and, you know, this day might be difficult. And if they're having a hard time, you want to treat them like this and you come with the best intentions and you get in front of your partner and they say that thing that always pisses you off and the bad devil on the other side, which is the inner you goes Mm -hmm. shut down Mm -hmm. because shut down is what you learn to do in order to protect yourself. When your father came at you with negative speech when you were young. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get on those two aspects of ourselves in alignment, all of the in good intentions of our outer you, right? Uh, the way the the people that pe- the, the the person that people encounter on a day to day basis cannot help but succumb to the inner you. So mm-hmm. that's what personal and internal transformation, inner transformation is about. Great. Um, I just want to add the one thing, and we cannot have the society that we hope for if we are not able to live that in live into that hope and into that expectation in the way that we live in our own lives. Mm. So I know that a lot of folks like you have been working on this question for a number of years. Uh, Where are the most exciting and aligned places for people doing the inner work and the outer work you know, and doing that transformation in tandem. Where is that happening? Yeah, I think there's a good number of uh, activist communities that have been infiltrated by uh, some of us that have been thinking about this work for a long time. For me, one of the juiciest places is embodiment or sometimes called somatics work that Mm -hmm. takes it kind of a next step and says, you know, it's not enough to just sit here and process this mentally in a contemplative form because the truth is Isaac is that if we look and we say well we've got like 50 years under our belt in terms of contemplative traditions eastern contemplative traditions that have unfolded in this country and that has not necessarily uh, altered the landscape in terms of how people relate to different forms of oppression that are in in our society. In fact, many people would say that our Dharma communities, that's the yoga traditions, the Buddhist traditions, some of the other Eastern traditions are microcosms of the larger society in terms of their replication of systems and forms of oppression. Uh, And so I think that taking it to the next level where we realize, whoa, we're not just heads, (laughs) we're actually bodies. And so how do we have ourselves to embody these principles, to embody compassion, to embody wisdom, and which, which I think takes us back to how do I embody comfort with the aspects of myself that I am uncomfortable with? How do I embody the capacity to listen to opinions and point of view that I don't agree with. It's great to think about that in meditation and think, oh, I, I'd love to be a better person. But if you don't have any practice where the rubber meets the road, which is in your real life, I, I, I don't think that it actually gets too far. I want to say it doesn't get far fast enough to mm. meet the rate of destruction that we are visiting upon our society. Mm, mm, right, right. Uh, where what organizations or movement spaces do you feel like are the most fertile ground right now for this kind of thinking? Uh, not enough. Not enough. The climate yeah. movement, you know, uh, I'd love to think with, with you about Black Lives Matter and how that has embodied these principles. I, I'm interested in where it's showing up. Yeah, I mean, I think that in some very intuitive and natural and organic ways, it's really showing up in the Black Lives Matter movement. It's really showing up in a much more fully articulated ways in the Black Liberation Movement, uh, broader than specifically Black Lives Matter. And that is having a bleeding effect into white anti-racist organizing movement. Uh, so, and and and, and uh, that's, that's right, further having an impact on other liberation movements. So I think that what's happening is that movements are seeing the nexus of their connection 
at that at that point of liberation, right? That what we're about is liberation. And how can you have social liberation if you don't have personal liberation? And so this is actually what the book that I most recently co-authored, Radical Dharma, is about is this nexus of personal liberation and social liberation. Mm -hmm. And the, the invitation is not for people to get married, right? Not to say like, hey, all you Buddhists, you should run off and become Black Lives Matter activists, or hey, Black Lives Matter, please go and try and hang out with these, uh, frankly, still overwhelmingly white uh, Buddhist and yogic traditions. It's saying you all have something to learn from each other. You're each holding um, an aspect of what we all need to integrate. And if you can learn something from each other in terms of your language, in terms of the pursuit of liberation, all of society is going to benefit. That's great. I want to read a quote that's uh, from the book. Uh, and I had an opportunity to read an advanced copy. It's amazing. It's a, a, a really think an amazing contribution to the conversation around racial politics and also around contemplative traditions, which I really think are having a continued appetite here uh, in the United States. And I think deepening that experience is what you're after and doing it in a real way. Um, so let's just listen to a quote really quickly. Um, Radical Dharma asks us to not only look, but also do the inner work that has been underemphasized. For too long, we've been beholden to a set of surface feelings, organizing around ideas and beliefs about what it means to be a good person or create good society. These efforts at good behavior and pursuit of good policies have proven to be no match for the deep embeddedness of what is the foundation of and has been intricately woven throughout every facet, institution, and relationship of the United States and the psyche of its inhabitants. The racialization of people and its underlying presupposition, the superiority of white-skinned peoples, a direct requirement of maintaining that position has always been and continues to be the inferiority of black people. Um, that's a very powerful, uh, very powerful quote and uh, an example of what you'll find in the book. Um, wh why did you write this book? Why did you write it? Yeah, I, I wrote it because I needed it. Uh, first and foremost, I needed something that would bridge the streams of liberation that were important for me. So uh, the liberation of people of colors, of black people in particular, was, is important to me. Uh, it's important to me because, the, you know, these are the people that I live with and grew up with and love and who I see uh, locked into a system of disparity and that continues to re-imagine itself and reorganize to, to maintain that, that social order of the inferiority of black peoples. And I want to say that for me in particular, that I benefit, many of you that are going to hear this through audio, uh, you're not going to necessarily know what I look like. So I benefit from fairer skin and um, mixed race, actually. And so I have you know, curlier hair, lighter skin. I speak the King's English quite well and have a good command of it. And so I don't experience a lot of the overt racism that is uh, what we think of when we think of racism in our, in our society. And that actually makes it more important for me to step in and step up to be able to say something about it, precisely because I benefit from the privilege of being able to enter into spaces in which, frankly, white folks find me more acceptable or appealing or accessible uh, when they, at least, at least until I start talking, <laughs> then they hear what I have to say, <laughs> right? And so I'm kind of, you know, easy on the eye colored person. You know? <laughs> that's just, that's, that's real, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, colored folks talk about a paper bag test, black folks talk about a paper bag test, and I, I passed the paper bag test. Um, on the other hand, you know, as we spoke about, I found profound peace and the potential for a life that is not fraught 
by merely the external circumstances and, and how I was shaped by that. And, and a view, even more importantly than for myself, but a view of society and a view of life and a view of what is possible came very much from my deepening into uh, personal practice and, and inner transformation. Mm -hmm. And so I feel so strongly that my my people right that are working towards their liberation on a social landscape will be so sh strengthened by having and i want to say this is whether they are devout christians or not right or devout muslims or not or if they have a spiritual tradition yoruba what uh, Vudun, whatever it may be or not, that this is because of the philosophical aspect, right? This is about a way of life and a perspective of life that can support us regardless of what our particular religious, spiritual, or non-orientation is at the current moment. That to have this view that is altered inside of us so that we have a strength that is regardless of conditions, right? Yeah. That transcends the external conditions. Um, the best example I can think of is, is Mandela, right? And the way in which the external conditions of his incarceration, and we could say that in many ways, people of color and black folks in this country are in a form of incarceration by the racialization of society and the oppressions that follow. That, that his incarceration he did not internalize that incarceration in such a way. In fact, he altered his inner landscape in such a way that he lived a free life regardless of where his body was. Mm, mm, mm. He lived a free life. He lived a liberated life regardless of the conditions. And I'm determined to convey and communicate the message that we can have a liberated life regardless of the external oppressions that exist and in a paradoxical like turn things upside down on their head we actually bring that liberated life socially into being by choosing a liberated life on a personal level mm -hmm. yeah and another quote from the from the book uh, until our capital v vision for liberation gives way to an accessible translatable, adaptable, yet rigorous praxis at meaningful scale, one that can match in energy and rebound through rhythm from the sustained stress, the structures of oppression that are designed to burden our minds and our bodies and our hearts. We cannot uproot those forces. Um, and, you know, what, what was so meaningful to me in that was the way that you, you know, I, I work with a lot of uh, faith organizers and faith folks and you know, faith is what matters. Belief is what matters. I believe in this hope, but, but the, the practice of sitting down and doing the work of changing the nature of our society, our minds, and how ourselves show up in that space is, was just such, a, such an inspiring thing to think about as a movement practice, as, a, as, a, as something that communities of faith and belief, spiritual communities can offer to the world. Uh, so I was really moved by that. Thank you. And I think one of the things that Radical Dharma offers, I mean, you know, we're not the first ones to talk about racial justice, for sure. And we're certainly not the first ones that is introducing or suggesting the idea that we need to have conversation. I think what Radical Dharma seeks to do is to bring this together and say, what we need to do is we need to have a practice of conversation right, that we want to bring our sort of spiritual sensibility of practice as a, as a pathway to actually embodying and bringing something into realization. Mm -hmm. We want to bring that practice sensibility to, into conversation. And by conversation, we mean a radical Dharma conversation, which means that is to say a complete, a whole truth, an honest conversation, a conversation in which we can bring ourselves as we are, and we invite you to come as you are, and we have a conversation from that place rather than from the tepid culture of politeness that runs rampant throughout American society and is a form of oppression in and of itself. Mm. 
so I think that that's really what radical Dharma offers is this in this invitation. And we're actually going to create guides that will support people in doing that to have these radical Dharma conversations as a practice. And one of the in, unusual features of radical Dharma, and, and we ran into an interesting experience with the editors, the senior editors, who's, who's great. And uh, we had this moment of saying, there were some suggestions around edits. And I said, no, no, we're not, you know, we're not gonna make those edits. And the, the editor's intention, well-intentioned view was like, well, it will make it more accessible. And I said, yes, that's, that's code language for it. it'll make it more accessible for white folks. Mm. And that's what the publishing industry tends to want to do because we live in a white supremacist society. We, we live in a society still in which the orientation and the acceptability that is deigned by, designed by white folks is what we um, all aspire to as a kind of ground zero of how we should be, look, walk and talk. And so a feature of Radical Dharma is that many of these conversations took place, even though they were recorded in the presence of, 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 of very mixed groups of people at, at every juncture. When Black folks are talking to Black folks, you actually hear the vernacular of Black people. So they're Black-centered conversations. And that is to say the there is an honesty and an uninhibitedness of black people choosing to show up as they are and not saying like, we're, we're making this book for you, but you are welcome, right? White America, white practitioners, white spiritual uh, uh, seekers, you are welcome into this conversation as long as you're willing to show, to come into this conversation and see us fully as we are because that gives you permission to be as you are. And for me, that's love. Mm -hmm. And that, right. And that's where the liberation of each people, each person is tied up in each other. Right. Uh, exactly. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about the title radical Dharma, uh, and help explain that title to folks that might not know even what Dharma is. We might know what radical is, but we might not. Yeah, sure. Well, a lot of us actually don't really think we don't really know what radical dar radical is. And, and in its true mm -hmm. uh, definition is, is at the root of it is radix, which means complete. And so the, we, you know, we go to kind of like a sort of full on political radical and, and, and that's scary for a lot of us and sounds threatening. And it's sounds like maybe people, you know, breaking things and tearing things up. And, and really uh, the intention is to say, it's, it, you need this to be complete. Well, complete what? Complete Dharma. Dharma is used in many traditions, Eastern traditions in different ways. And one of the things that has been important for me is to lift Dharma up out of solely the notion of being Buddhist in its capital D, D-H-A-R-M-A form. It's considered the historical Buddhist teaching specifically, but you kind of branch out a little bit more out of the Buddhist uh, corner, if you will, and it's Dharma is truth. It's universal truth. And there are yogic traditions that think of it as one's path, one's unfolding, right? But essentially it's one's truth. And so radical Dharma is to say the, the whole truth, the complete truth, meaning that we want to view reality from a perspective of bringing all of what is true into our view. That we don't want to leave parts out that make us uncomfortable. That we don't want to leave parts of society out that make us uncomfortable. That we don't want to ignore the aspects of our society, our history, what this country has been built on that is convenient for us to leave out. Because when we leave those things out, we leave part of ourselves out. We, leave, we have to cut something off in order to ignore it, in order to paper it over. And the, the constructs and systems of oppression and the, the, uh, off, the, the, the um, systems of privilege that we have, have made many of us blind to those things and we don't go and peer. Well, that's our job. That's our job as spiritual practitioners. That's our job as activists. That's our jobs as people loving people. 
That's our jobs as people that believe in freedom, people that are invested in liberation and a free and just society that works for all. It's our job to look at the complete truth, even when it hasn't been put at our doorstep to mm-hmm. inquire, to find the place in, places in us and in our society that are in, uncomfortable and go and look at them and bring them to the table. Mm. Mm. Great. Um, I'm hearing your bird in the background. Yes. <laughs> does, does your bird want to make a cameo and say hi? Uh, well, he's he's a little far away, but he, you know, what happens, I think sometimes is that when I do interviews, he hears the rhythm of my voice and so he wants to sing along. So he's, oh, that's so beautiful. So he he won't make a he won't make a visual cameo, but he's definitely at the very end. We can get to yeah. He's checking checking. He's he's going along with. Oh us. great! I love it. I love it. He's like uh, he's like I'm vibing on you. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, it's good. It's great. All right. Uh, so a couple fun questions now. Maybe fun. Yeah. Let's see if you find them fun. I okay. Find them fun. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say from whose perspective? Yeah, exactly. We'll see. Uh, all right, so if you, I know the, the primary is in California today, uh, yes. and if you had five minutes with any presidential candidate, who would you choose to talk to and what would you say? Um, I'd choose to talk to Hillary Clinton and I would say apologize. Acknowledge that um, you're, human, you're a human being, that you have some aspects of yourself as a human being that you're still working with and it because of the level of the playing field that you're working on your personal I want to call them neuroses right or that your personal challenges show up on the broad stage but you're entitled to that and we are a forgiving people and we have a great deal of empathy for recognizing that we're human we, we sometimes just need people to say that. So say, you know what, I'm a really private person. And so I set this thing up and it's, yeah, you can see now that that's not cool. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, there's, you know, it doesn't seem like malice is intended and we, we want to create a society that's much more um, forgiving. And that, that, includes the fact that our leaders are human beings and we have to drop this orientation that suggests that somehow they shouldn't be. So I just say, you know, girl, apologize. It's, it's, we, we want to know that you're human and I totally get it. I, I, you seem like an introvert to me. <laughs> and so say, you know what, I, I'm not so good with this whole public thing. Uh, but, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm down to do what's necessary to run the country and I'm going to work, with, work with those things. I might even try some meditation. Nice, nice. If you had any time left over, a few minutes of meditation with Hillary Clinton. I love it. That's exactly right. Uh, that's right. Uh, okay. So uh, if you could spend a year anywhere in the world at no cost to you, the people you care about, or your career, where would you go and why? Oh, I mean, it's Istanbul without a doubt. Uh, I spend some time in Istanbul already. I spent two and a half months uh, there from the end of the year and right into the February. Um, and you know, why is one of those really funny questions? I could give you a list of things. I could talk about the golden horn and about the way that I think that the goddess wakes up in the morning. She looks at the golden horn. She says, yes, it, everything is okay. And she turns around and she goes back to sleep and she shines the, the, the light of her, her eyes upon the, upon that, that body of water and, and this, these, this amazing city that sits on two continents. But you really can't say why you are in love with someone. And Istanbul personified is uh, my lover. Uh, I get there and something changes in my cellular organization at a deep level. I love the people. I love the language that I don't understand. Um, I love iron, salty yogurt drink, much to my chagrin. Uh, I eat too much breaded products when I'm there, but I love every aspect of it. I love the way that it feels on my body and my being. And that's where I would stay. Mm. Mm. When did you first get to Istanbul? I first visited Istanbul on a total fluke in 2009, I think it was. And I had no idea 
you know, anything about Istanbul. The only thing, you know, terrible, you know, how Americans are, we sort of associate things. I was like, well, I know they'll have lugs. You know, that's kind of like as, <laughs> that's kind of as, <laughs> as I was. Uh, and I got there and I totally fell in love. And I, I will say just, you know, I know these are fun questions, but this is really a part of it. One thing is that, um, and I have some thoughts about creating a fellowship for people that are really trying to think about race in our country. One thing about going to countries in which the racialization of is not of, of peoples is not the primary order of society. It's got its issues, you know, b- believe me. But the racialization is not the primary order is that as a person that has always lived under racialization, right? I'm not on the top. Mm-hmm to exist and to be in a society in which that is not the, the, orga- the organizational structure is so liberating in a way that uh, is truly profound and you don't really know it, know it and feel it until you've been there for a while. And so mm. um, I want to invite anyone that uh, is doing deep thinking and to recognize that like the deep thinkers about race in our, in our country and our history have all left Angela Davis, Malcolm X, um, you know, Marcus Garvey, James Baldwin, the list goes on. Kind of easy codes to kind of easy codes in, in, in the modern times. That's right. 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 And it's not that race doesn't exist in other places, but it's not our problem, right? It's not our race problem. It's a different yeah. thing. And, mm-hmm. and the structures of society are different. So it's a very powerful thing. And and for what for me, what it has done is to I'm actually able to take more responsibility for the ways in which I unknowingly have played a part in, in uh, those forms of oppression. Mm. I was talking to a young uh, black organizer here in uh, New York who had the same experience visiting Israel, mm-hmm. uh, where she just, she was like, I, I loved being there. I felt, in a sense, I felt like a breath of, breath of fresh air. I needed it. Um, and as a, as a Jewish person, it was so interesting to me to hear about how liberation in Israel is tied up for black folks. And she's talking about her community that goes now. And like, it, and it's just an amazing window into the, the way that this story, these stories and this oppression is heavy here, just yeah. heavy for folks. So, uh, yeah, well, that's beautiful. Thank you for telling me about Istanbul. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Um, uh, I have yeah, so, every, so this is it. If anybody wants to ever contribute to Angel's Istanbul Fund, you are more than welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That'll go in the show notes. We want a contribution to Istanbul. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, so if you had um, one thing that uh, you would ask people who are listening to this uh, podcast or interview uh, to do, what would it be? One thing that I would ask them to do? Yeah. Yeah, um, invest. Uh, not you know, my assemble fund is a good I- fund is a good idea for me. Um, invest rigorously uh, today in creating a more liberated life for yourself. Discover what it is. Probe, test, make notes, recognize it when you see it and invest in a more liberated life for yourself uh, right this very moment in every moment that you become aware that you are becoming smaller, that you are shrinking, that you are not living into who you fully are. Uh, Do that for yourself because you doing that for yourself is the best gift that you can offer me. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, so when is Radical Dharma coming out? Radical Dharma uh, is available right this very moment. Fantastic. Uh, pre-release, right? And so it'll and then it will ship out into the world. Uh, we like to say the week of Juneteenth. It's technically on June fourteenth, um, and yeah, that that for those of you that are listening, if um, this it falls within that timeline. It's really incredibly helpful for us to actually have plenty of people reveal their interest in the week preceding, it's the time preceding its release and, and that week in particular are, are most helpful. And so if you're feeling like you're holding off, you can pre-release and you know just keep it in a box <laughs> whenever you're holding off to read it. 
Um, and, and we're very excited that it was, we chose this particular time because Juneteenth is, is a, a important symbolic date for uh, African-Americans, for those, mo most of us know about the Emancipation Proclamation, it was in 1863, but it took two full years for slaves in Galveston, Texas to receive the news, and they received it on June 19th in 1865, and so Juneteenth represents, for me, is symbolic of liberation um, for Black folks in particular, but liberation for us all, so it seemed like a good day to come up. That's great. That's great. Well, I uh, really do encourage you to read the book, Radical Dharma, uh, on shelves very soon. Thank you so much for this conversation, Reverend Angel. Where can folks find you online? They can find me uh, at Angel Kyoto. That's Kyoto with a D, K-Y-O-D-O, -O, Williams. Dot com, and they can find Radical Dharma at Radical Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A dot org. Uh, I have to say that I'm infinitely Googleable, but if you ever run into Angel Williams, who's a mud wrestler, I promise you it's not me. So if you have to choose, take the Zen priest, not the mud wrestler. <laughs> have you ever reached out to the other Angel Williams? You know, I should, as I was sitting here and I was thinking that I was like, you know, maybe I just should because she should send all my traffic back and I should send her traffic to her. Exactly. And at least having a conversation would be great. Okay. Well, that'll be for the next time we talk. Uh, we'll talk about uh, you reaching out to Angel Williams, and mud wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For time. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and, uh, and I'll, be in touch about, uh, you know, the edited interview and everything. I'm going to um, stick here. And if you could, where you are, leave on the um, audio recording for another 30 seconds to make sure that we get a nice, maybe we'll have a little sit for 30 seconds. And, uh, you know, then we get the nice, good quality quiet that we need to make a good audio. So. Great. Okay. Nice. Can the bird make a cameo? Do you think the bird can make a cameo on the? Yeah, he can make a cameo. Um, let me see. Save audio. Unhook myself from this. Okay, Mitra, now that I'm not talking, you don't want to talk, huh? Yeah. Why don't you come and say hello? Come and say hello? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hello. What's yeah. the bird's name? His name is Mitra. Mitra. Yeah, Mitra means a uh, spiritual friend in Sanskrit. And that's why I often tell people he's not my pet. He's my spiritual friend. He's your Mitra. Yeah, and he makes me a much better human being. So everybody loves Mitra because before Mitra came to live with us here about, uh, well, how long have you been here? Yeah, about eight and a half years ago. Um, I didn't actually talk to people that much <laughs> that I lived with. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I talked for very specific occasions and needs, but I didn't banter. But he requires that kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, connection. You know, there's, he's so smart, they actually take up, you know, um, human orientation around, like, you know, being neurotic if they get left out of things. And, and so if he's not talked to, then his uh, his development his you know psychological emotional development suffers 
And so he made me talk to people more because then it, of course it wouldn't do that if I, I talked to the bird, but I wouldn't talk to everybody else. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful so I thing. Had up, I had to give up a little bit of my Zen cool when he came. <laughs> It's good. Not only do you have to talk to them, he much prefers like high pitched voices and mm. emphasis and right, and, right, right, right. And so yeah. it's like talking to like like a child around, right? You then have to you know coo and all those kinds of things. Is he a co-author of Radical Dharma? Oh, he's totally a co-author of Radical Dharma. Yeah, he's a beautiful boy. Yeah, I love him terribly. Mm. Thank you for giving him a, a shout out. That's great. Yeah, he might end up in the podcast. Yeah, way. I think he, I can see that he's doing that. He's he he was really like, it's the rhythmic sound, and then he just gets going. No, I like it. I like it. I love the um, I love the way that it involves like it adds richness to the storyline. You know, it's like it's beautiful. Like the richness is is what we're after. You know, um, that's really great. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna run. I'll send this to you. Great. Patience and talk to you soon. Wonderful. We'll do. Okay. Bye bye.